separate it and put it. And it is light. Okay. okay. Please, thank you. please, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, my dear friends. Thank you very much for joining us in this press conference. We have with us UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of Myanmar, on the situation of human rights in Myanmar, Ms. Yang Lee Lee. Ms. Lee from Republic of Korea. Refugees. In a number of camps and settlements, as well as the government, UN humanitarian, UN humanitarian and protection actors and NGOs. I also thank the UN country team in Myanmar for speaking with me. I took many photos of what I saw and will upload them on Flickr. The link will be on my special rapporteur webpage. What I am presenting today are preliminary findings resulting from this visit. My report to the third committee of the 73rd UN GM General Assembly in October will contain more detailed information. Recently, I have received more questions than ever about my mandate and work on Myanmar. I have also read reports that state that I no longer hold the mandate or that I have been replaced by the special envoy of the Secretary General of the United Nations. At the outset, I would like to clarify that my mandate was established by the Human Rights Council, a body that was established in 2006 pursuant to the Resolution 60-251 of the General Assembly. My mandate was renewed this March for a, year, for a period of one year. The Special Rapporteur is an independent expert who is mandated to monitor and report on the situation of human rights in Myanmar to the Human Rights Council and to the General Assembly every year. My role is therefore different to that of a Special Envoy, an individual dignitary who is appointed by the Secretary General to provide good offices and to pursue discussion on a range of issues. Additionally, through my recent discussions, I need to provide further clarification on two other issues. First, the critical issue of status. The people who fled decades-long systematic discrimination and recent extreme violence in Myanmar and now live in overcrowded camps in Bangladesh are Rohingya refugees. International law is very clear. The definition of refugees provided by Article 1 of the 1951 Refugee Convention replies, applies the refugees from Myanmar living in Bangladesh and other countries. The Rohingyas in Bangladesh fled Myanmar owing to a well-founded fear of prosecution and as a result of ongoing persecution uh, by the government and the military for reasons of their identity, race, and religion. They must be recognized as Rohingya refugee by all, including by host governments such as Bangladesh, and, and they must be referred to as refugees in all public and private statements by all actors, as well as on any documentation issued to them. Refusal to recognize their identity, their ethnicity, and their current status denies them rights to which they are entitled, not least the right of non refoulement to Myanmar. Second, we must also acknowledge not only the Rohingya status as stateless people, but the way in which this statelessness came about. Rohingya citizenship rights have been systematically discriminated back since the 1970s, and they have been effectively barred from accusing them since the introduction of the 1982 citizenship law. The Myanmar government has discriminatorily denied citizenship to them since that time and continues to do so. While I was in Cox's Bazaar, I met with refugees who showed me documentation related to citizenship held by previous generations, including their parents and grandparents, that they have carefully preserved. 
When we speak of the future of the Rohingya citizenship, we must speak of its restoration by the government of Myanmar and not use vague terminology such as pathway to citizenship. Doing so denies the reality of what has happened as well as the dignity of the people that it happened to and does not provide a durable and long-lasting solution for the Rohingya population. The Myanmar government has committed to ensuring a pathway to citizenship for the Rohingya people. However, in reality, for years, successive governments have placed the Rohingya on a pathway away from the citizenship rights that they previously enjoyed. During this mission, I have had the opportunity to have teleconferences with various individuals and groups in Myanmar. I am alarmed by what I was told about the developments affecting the human rights of those in Myanmar by all the people I spoke to on this trip in person and by phone. Overwhelming, overwhelmingly, the message that they gave me is that enough is enough. The reprehensible situation that exists for the people of Myanmar must end today. It was reported to me that the democratic space in Myanmar continues to sharply deteriorate. Repressive laws, for example, the telecommunications law, the peaceful assembly and peaceful procession law, and unlawful associations law continue to be used to suppress the legitimate exercise of the rights of freedom of expression, assembly and association, and freedom of press. I have received credible information that at least six persons were charged under Section 66D of Myanmar's telecommunications law in June 2018 while exercising their legitimate freedoms. The arbitrary and subjective interpretation and applications of these laws to suppress political dissidents, youth, human rights defenders, and activists has resulted in their continuing to be political detainees and prisoners, despite so many members of the NLD having been political prisoners themselves. I urge the government to repeal and amend the problematic laws that I have repeatedly planned and undertake the necessary work to ensure people in Myanmar do not live in a climate of fear while exercising their fundamental democratic rights. I am told that on 9 July, the two Reuters journalists who have faced prolonged legal proceedings in, since December last year will finally hear whether there is a case against them or if they will be discharged. They have reportedly been deprived of medical support and subjected to sleep deprivation in contravention, contravention of the prohibition against inhumane and degrading treatment and the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. I have recently received reports that police violently suppressed a protest against the erection of a statue of General Aung San in Kayaste, home to ethnic Kareni people. Ten youth were arrested and charged with incitement under Section 505B and C of the Penal Code in relation to a letter that they distributed to the protesters. This is the latest series in a series of arbitrary arrests of young demonstrators around the country who are seeking to exercise their right of peaceful assembly in the causes of peace and respect for ethnic minority rights. The topic of minority rights have been slated for discussion at the upcoming 21st century, third 21st century Bangal Peace Conference. However, reportedly, it is now off the agenda. With minority rights issues, including discrimination, being at the core of so many problems faced by Myanmar, I urge all relevant stakeholders to begin to have these difficult discussions as resolution of these issues will be critical to Myanmar's peaceful future. I spoke with people in Kayin and Shan states who have informed me about the terrifying new tactic of the Tetmadaw, what uses civilians in conflict zones as human shields. This is a serious violation of international humanitarian law and must be stopped immediately. The 20,000 people who have been newly displaced in these states remain, un remain 
unable to safely return home and have very little assistance <coughs> with humanitarian access being increasingly constrained, including for national organizations. This occurrence is a violation of Myanmar's obligation under international humanitarian law to allow and facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage of humanitarian relief for civilians in need. In Shan State, I'm told of persistent arrests of individuals in rural areas who are suspected of supporting Shan armed groups on the basis of their having hunting rifles, which were reportedly lawfully obtained. Land confiscation by the military has long been a serious issue in Myanmar. However, it is apparent to me that some very concerning trends are emerging whereby people displaced by violence or conflict around the country are effectively being deprived of their land by the government. In Kachin, the number of plant banana plantations being established on the land of those who fled is increasing. Several hundreds of IDPs in Michinao reportedly have been recently been relocated to land chosen by the government, not their places of origin or choosing, and given no assistance other than three months of food rations. I'm greatly worried about what future will bring for these people and others if this trend continues in conflict areas of the country. During this visit to Bangladesh, I spoke to some refugees who arrived in Pakaksa's Bazaar in recent days. What they told me indicates that the situation in northern Rakhine is far from stable or safe. Systematic violence targeted against the remaining Rohingya population continues. These refugees tell me that the Myanmar security forces have entered their villages and told them that they must accept the national verification cards, the NVC, a form of documentation that does not provide citizenship rights and which the Rohingya reject, or they were told to leave. Several of the women I told me, told, that I talked to told me that the security forces search for their husbands who have been staying out of their homes in fear. They said that they have been raped when their husbands were not found. I was horrified to be told by one woman that her 12-year-old son had been chopped to pieces when he visited the family's fish hatchery after the family had been told by security forces that they could not go there unless they accepted the NBC. Such brutality, and to a child, is deplorable. I also visited no man's land between Myanmar and Bangladesh. Apparently 4,200 Rohingyas are <coughs> The more, majority of them are on the Myanmar side, and approximately 20% on the Bangladeshi side. They told me about the difficulties they face. I saw Myanmar border guard posts that watch them from overlooking hills and the reinforced barbed wire fence recently built by the Myanmar government. Some of the people's homes are just 10 minutes away from where they shelter now. They told me that each day, loudspeakers on the Myanmar side of the fence play a recording telling them that it is illegal for them to be there and to leave as well as playing recordings of Buddhist sermon. I also met with a young boy who was shot by the Myanmar border guard just a few days ago. He had been alone and looking for something in the grass. His friends had just returned to the camp after playing football. A single shot was fired from the Myanmar side and hit him in the hip. Targeting a child in such a way is an illegal and truly cowardly act and must be strongly condemned. In Cox's Bazaar, the refugees who have survived years of heinous violations and abuses in Rakhine State have been visited and interviewed by countless celebrities, high-profile individuals, politicians, researchers, human rights organizations, journalists, the list goes on. While it is crucial to speak to the victims and human rights monitoring is essential, I was told by several victims that they have been repeatedly interviewed by multiple people. I am very concerned about this. And I would like to urge all international and national actors to treat the victims with dignity and not ask them to repeatedly recount dramatic experiences. They have endured some of the most horrific experiences and must not be continually exposed, re-victimized, and re-traumatized 
partially, particularly without access to necessary psychosocial help. As it is now clear that the Myanmar government has made no progress or shown any real will to dismantle the system of discrimination in the country's laws, policies, and practices, and to make northern Rakhine state safe, the Rohingya refugees will not be returning to Myanmar in the near future. There must be, therefore, a shift to medium and longer term planning in Cox's Bazaar. I am concerned that the humanitarian response remains in the emergency phase with the focus on providing basic assistance to the community. It is now time work, it is now time to work with the community so that it can assist itself as it, as it is more than capable of doing. It is not true that the community is leaderless and unable to speak for itself. During this mission, I met with impressive, inspiring, determined groups of emerging community leaders who are mobilizing and clearly articulating their demands. These groups must be given space and support to develop so that they can meaningfully, meaningfully represent the communities in different fora, including in the humanitarian response, meet patriation, planning and implementation, and a discussion of accountability options. From my, from my discussions with refugee and humanitarian actors, I see that there are three things that are greatly needed to ensure the future of Rohingya refugees community. First, education for all. This means girls and boys commensurate to beyond primary school education to the maximum level possible, as well as older people who were denied education in Myanmar. Second, there must be access to meaningful livelihood opportunities and vocational training for women and men. Third, and critical to both of these issues, are the ability of the Rohingya to live in a dignified life, is freedom of movement. This is not just about being able to move from one place to another, but it is about freedom, humanity, being able to access services, receive medical treatment, and fulfill their basic personal needs like meeting relatives who live in other places. In other words, living a dignified life. I would commend the humanitarian community in Cox's Bazaar that is working tirelessly to support the refugees. The work they are doing is incredibly difficult, and I'm very impressed by their dedication. The Bangladesh government and its humanitarian partners have worked hard to reinforce the camp infrastructure and pre prepare for the monsoon. However, with the rain and cyclone season underway, the conditions are getting worse as a, as a result of landslides and floods. While I was in the camps, I experienced heavy rain and very hot weather. Needless to say, the monsoon and cyclones will return every year. Additionally, the camps are so severely and inhumanely overcrowded, I am very concerned about protection and gender-based violence risks. I received very troubling reports of violence in the camps allegations of trafficking of women and girls, domestic violence, exploitation, and widespread gender and sexual, gender, sexual and gender-based violence. As people continue to arrive, congestion <coughs> only increases, as do the risks of public and individual health. I urge all humanitarian actors to put protection and gender at the forefront of their work. The Bangladeshi authorities should also step up their efforts to address ongoing violence, trafficking, and other forms of illegal activities in the camps that affect the lives and well-being of Rohingya refugees. These efforts must be consistent with international standards. The Joint Response Plan is only 26% funded. I appeal to the donors to step up and provide the funding that is urgently needed to move to medium and long, longer term planning. I was concerned to be told by disability organizations that inclusion of persons with disabilities is not a priority across all sectors in the JRP. This must be rectified if we are to live up to the principle of leaving no one behind. The international community should not forget the host community in Cox's Bazaar who, are, who have been sharing their resources with the Rohingya refugees. And resources should also be supported, directed to support that community. 
I understand the government of Bangladesh plans to relocate refugees from Cox's Bazar to Bonchonchar, an island that has recently appeared in the Bay of Bengal. I have requested the government to facilitate a visit for me to see the conditions of the island. It was conveyed to me by the Bangladesh officials that construction on the island is ongoing and that my visit will only be possible after the rainy season. I am hoping to visit the island in the near future to assess the conditions. The statement about visiting after the rainy season, however, concerns me greatly, as it indicates that access to the island is difficult or impossible during the monsoon time and raises many questions about the fate of those who may be sent there. As far as I understand, the United Nations and international humanitarian organizations have not carried out any technical or humanitarian assistance to determine whether the island is habitable for human beings. I am yet not aware whether and how the 100,000 refugees who it is said to be relocated will be chosen, how the movement of refugees in and out of the island will be facilitated, and how refugees will be able to access livelihood opportunities, health and education on a remote and isolated island. A few weeks after hearing the news of signing the Memorandum of Understanding between the Government of Myanmar, United Nations Development, UNDP, and UNHCR, I sent a request to the Government of Myanmar through its permanent mission in Geneva for a copy of the MOU. They did not provide me with a copy, but instead shared me, shared me with a summary that was prepared by one of the UN agencies. Over the last weeks, I also made requests in senior in person to senior officials of the United Nations, who despite promises have not shared a copy of the MOU with me. The refugees I spoke with in Cox's Bazaar expressed their deep concerns, disappointment and anger over the lack of consultation on their fate. I expressed my dismay on the Human Rights Council over the lack of transparency on 27th of June. While I am not aware of the exact terms of the MOU, I am extremely concerned that it has been kept secret, including by the United Nations agencies involved, and urge the parties to make it public. As I have previously said, talk now of repatriation is pre extremely premature. While in Cox's Bazaar, I was told that there are plans for refugee consultation and discussions, but this is not enough. Refugee men, women, and children must be given the opportunity to participate in all phases of the design and implementation of the repatriation operation in accordance to, with UNHCR's handbook on voluntary repatriation. I reiterate that my, any voluntary and non-consultative return of the refugees is against the principle of international law and must not take place. I further astonished by the lack of any meaningful progress regarding creating conditions in Myanmar for the return of refugees from other countries. With the situation of the Rohingyas in Cox's Bazaar being extremely precarious and should continue to get urgent attention from the international community, the refugees from Myanmar who live in extreme harsh living and security conditions <coughs> elsewhere, including some neighboring countries of Myanmar, are equally entitled to a safe, voluntary, dignified, and sustainable return to their homes of origin. During this mi mission, I spoke by phone to refugees from Myanmar in, in India who live in a state of fear and uncertainty and with the threat of forced deportation by the government of India. This situation has received little attention by the international community. UNHCR and UN agencies responsible for the protection of refugees must step up their support to ensure protection and human dignity of the refugees in India who live in such a dreadful situation. As I said earlier, enough is enough. Justice is a key demand of the Rohingya refugees I spoke during, to, to, during my mission and of activities in civil society in Myanmar. Accountability for the atrocities committed is urgently needed and must be delivered for all the people of Myanmar who suffered violations and abuses of human rights and violations of international humanitarian law. It is more than clear now, unless the cycle of violence and persecution is broken, 
violations of human rights and international humanitarian law will continue in Myanmar. The enduring impunity must come to an end. When I presented to the Human Rights Council on 27th of June, I proposed to establish an accountability mechanism for Myanmar. I am pleased to note that the High Commissioner of Human Rights has also called for an internationally accountable mechanism in line with my proposal. I urge the international community to come together without delay and establish the mechanism at the Human Rights Council session in September. Let us stop for a moment and imagine the lives of the refugees, leaving their homes, cattle, rice paddocks, and living in the refugee camps. Every day is a reminder of what happened in Myanmar, their home country, and their uncertain future. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm Siraj Mukadir. I work okay. for. Uh, you should moderate. The uh, uh, I'm Sir. This is Sir Kadir. I work for writers. I have a couple of questions. Number one, uh, you have been in Paksal Bazar for uh, a week, and during your stay, among others, you have also heard about the trafficking. So, do you have any specific information or any specific figure or anything on the specific on the issue? Number one. And number two, you have sought uh, permission from Indian government to also enter in that country. What was their uh, response? Okay, three, three questions. Dear media, media friends, we will be taking three questions at a time. Then uh, Excellency will be answered. Then we'll go for next round. Next two persons. <coughs> Thank you, Madam. Uh, my name is Moin Uthin. I represent UNB, United News of Bangladesh. It's a new agency. UNB? UNB, United okay. News of Bangladesh. Okay. Uh, UN Human Rights uh, Commissioner uh, recently asked the UN Security Council to immediately refer uh, Myanmar to ICC, International Criminal Court. Do you see any possibility? And uh, my second question is that. Uh, you were denied uh, access to Myanmar. Have you communicated it officially with the, uh, China to help from China to convince Myanmar to get access? To? Thank you. Can I have a question in Al Jazeera, please? Next. Okay, no problem. Uh, it is Shahid Ruslan Chaudhary from New Age. Uh, you have mentioned uh, that he, your UN colleagues uh, didn't share you uh, the MOU signed with Myanmar. If uh, your colleagues uh, uh, do not share a simple paper with you, since you are part of them, how do you expect that the root causes uh, uh, in Rakhine will be addressed for accommodating uh, Rohingyas in the Myanmar system? Yeah, yeah. And, and just a supplement, can you? I'm from BD News 24 October. You said that enough is enough and justice is the key demand. So, to who you are saying this? Because Myanmar is listening to anybody. Excellent. Yes, thank you very much for these very um, important questions. In response to trafficking, in response to trafficking, uh, I've spoken with the authorities there, and they are aware of the uh, situation. Uh, and I've spoken with the UN partners and INGO partners uh, there also. And we are, uh, many of the uh, UN actors and INGO actors have been uh, um, conducting awareness raising campaigns with the women and men of, um, who are living in the camps the refugees to protect their women, not to let women, girls, to give up their little girls, to be aware of the traffic. The security forces, the police are guarding the area. Everybody has to leave uh, in the evening out of the camp, but nevertheless, there are some cases where uh, I, I know that uh, has been reported, or at least it's also in the um, surveillance of the um, police. But the only thing we need to do is to really build the capacity of the community there. Uh, build uh, the, the family's capacity, build uh, the 
organic uh, organizations and, and uh, youth groups and young children groups to not uh, fall prey to um, trafficking and to parents to understand how important it is to uh, keep their children protected. India and its response. Uh, yes, I've requested many times to India for a visit to the country. They have not responded. And um, yeah, so this is, uh, I don't know uh, why they haven't responded. I would hope that they would either respond yes or no, but they haven't done that either. They just did not respond and after repeated uh, official letters to them. Um, the High Commissioner uh, called to refer to the ICC. Yes, I joined his call and I have made the call too. Uh, as you know, um, referral to ICC under the current structure of the international fora is that the Security Council has to refer to the ICC. Uh, as you know, there are two uh, permanent uh, seats in ICC that are friends of Myanmar uh, that will not uh, make this happen. So it is in the long shot, and this is why I am uh, recommending an accountability mechanism to be established um, immediately. Denial to Myanmar, have I written to China to facilitate my access? I'm, I'm not sure why this question is coming up, because I, Myanmar, I'm, is a sovereign state. Uh, China is not the guardian of Myanmar. Nevertheless, <laughs> the protector of Myanmar. Uh, I think Myanmar should make its own independent uh, decision. However, I am going to uh, request China to, for a visit uh, because I'd like to see the border areas where uh, some of the Myanmar uh, people are taking refuge in the Chinese side. And I hope to, with China being one of the global leaders and uh, becoming very prominent in the global, in all global areas, global issues, I think uh, China should also take the lead in the global human rights discussions and should allow me access to visit their, uh, the refugees from uh, Myanmar. The, the MOU has not been shared with me. If they're not, they're, I'm not part of the UN system. I, I'm an independent. I'm a, uh, I am appointed by the member states of Human Rights Council. So I don't work for UN, but I have. I also, uh, of course, they kind of they cooperate with me, and. Their mandate is to cooperate with me too. And I'm mandated to monitor all human rights violations and abuses committed by all parties, any parties. So I'm consistently asking for this. Uh, I've spoken to the high level, the highest level that was here, and he had promised to share this with me. I have yet to receive it. Thank you. Al Jazeera. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I guess one of the questions you already answered on the ICC issue. So my next question is, uh, uh, from what you said all along, my impression is that it doesn't look like most of the Rohingya refugees are gonna be repatriated anytime soon. Is that your impression and you think it's a long-term stay over in Bangladesh? And the number two question is, uh, more and more when we visit the camp, I have a range of camp leaders and others saying that look, all kinds of agreement and negotiations are going on in different countries and other places by UN and Bangladesh, but we don't have a representation in this. Uh, we'd like a representation because it's our future that you all are talking about. So do you see any possibilities of that, that when there is a representation by Myanmar leaders or somebody chosen by them to be in this negotiation and MOUs? or agreement signed. Thank you. Who else over here? Well, Madam Lee, I'm actually lost. Uh, 
having heard your long statement to where to start or what to ask. Uh, but I would uh, uh, try to shed some lights on uh, two, three of your points. Uh, number one, you were asking the government of Bangladesh to recognize them as refugees, despite the fact that Bangladesh is not a uh, party to the 1951 uh, convention, number one. Number two, oh, well, forgive me if I got it wrong, but uh, I think you have uh, said uh, that there are some uh, violation of human rights of the refugees in the camps uh, as we speak, uh, by maybe by Bangladeshis or maybe by people uh, from Myanmar. Uh, well, have you, uh, have you uh, raised this issue with the competent authorities of Bangladesh? Because in my opinion, it's a very serious uh, uh, thing. And you talked about international standard. I mean, uh, we have recently become uh, LDC. We are one of the, I mean, we are the country that has one of the restrained and constrained resources. How on earth can you expect international standards in a country like Bangladesh, which has a billions of problems of its own? Are, aren't you asking for too much? Thank you. Independent. By the way, my name is Hoa Kobir Bhuya. I work for The Independent. It's an English daily that is published from the capital. Bangla Tribune. I'm Sharyal Zaman. I'm from Bangla Tribune. I'm just taking a cue from my friend. You're talking about the international standard. When the international, you say that 26% of the page was made in the joint response plan. When the international community is not that standard, how do you expect that Bangladesh will maintain the international standard? That is because the international community is not uh, at, at par with their standard. And you are talking about the 51 convention. Hungary was uh, deployed army at their border not to enter the refugees in their country, even though they are the uh, signing of uh, 51 convention. But even though Bangladesh is not a 51 convention signatory. And the second one is you wanted to go to the Bhashan job. Uh, if I understand that you are actually a, you are a special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Myanmar, do you have mandate to go to the Bhashan job or ask for it? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I provoked some very interesting uh, questions uh, from you. Uh, long term, yes, they're going to be here. Uh, they're not going to re be repatriated to Myanmar anytime near f in the near future. Why? Because the conditions in Myanmar is not conducive for their return. This is why. This is so sadly why. Um, Discussions without representations, absolutely. No discussions should be conducted in any forum or any forum without the discussions of the di person directly concerned. I just want to uh, say that uh, when the negotiations for the conventions for the rights of persons with, with disabilities was ongoing, I took part of that too. The campaign, the slogan for it was nothing about us without us. This should be a standard for any, oh, me, for any discussions, for any persons, for any reasons. So there has to be uh, representation by the people that were selected organically from the community, not by the persons who were selected by whoever. Uh, it has to be a community-based, uh, bottom-up approach. Uh, the second and third uh, questions, I'm going to uh, answer these uh, in, in order. How do you 
Well, I say recognize them as refugees, but uh, yes, I, I do understand. I do. I have told you that you, the, uh, Bangladesh is not party to the stateless convention. I hope there's no misunderstanding that uh, that particular convention has now become a customary international law. And some of the uh, concerns that by giving them the title of recognizing these people as refugees, that they will not be able to repatriate them. The Myanmar government will not take them back. That is not so. Every human being has a right to return. And, and each time anybody crosses their country borderline for reasons of persecution of, of whatever form, they are recognized as refugees. Refu uh, violations from Bangladesh in the camps, have I re I'll raise it to the authorities? I hope there's no misunderstanding. I'm not saying there's uh, violations committed by Bangladesh for, 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 with people inside the camps. I'm not saying that. The government authorities know that there are violations being uh, going on inside the camp, be it physical, be it uh, robbery, petty theft, be it domestic violence, killing. Okay. So they know this. And uh, we want, and, I, and they are very concerned about this, and they are working with the local community uh, refugees and other UN actors to, uh, to uh, provide some solutions and, uh, and to, to find uh, an answers to this. Myanmar is LDC, least uh, Bangladesh. So how do you expect international standards? I think you sir said the same thing. International standards, I, I hope there's no misunderstanding. I think our partners, our friends from this side think that, uh, that I am accusing Myanmar for not, uh, Bangladesh for not uh, go, living up to the international standards. What I'm saying is, that for 26% of the joint response policy, do, I'm raising the issue that when there is a commitment, when there is a pledge from the from international community, they are responsible to provide the otherwise don't pledge any pledges. Right? So I am raising this issue. Um, Myanmar's international standard. When Myanmar, uh, when uh, I'm sorry, Bangladesh, when Bangladesh signs international human rights treaties or conventions, or international or or even international. Um, Treaties. That means Bangladesh is it's accepting those standards and norms, and they're accepting to comply to them. And this is what I'm saying. For all those international instruments that Bangladesh has uh, signed up to ratify, is where they should uh, keep their end. Uh, but I'm not accusing that Bangladesh is not doing this. My terms of the international standards means is more focused on the international community, for it, such as these MOUs that are going on and the repatriation process, but the discussions within agencies and among agencies must uh, be up to international standards. That is what I'm stressing. Caution chart. My mandate covers the pe Myanmar people of Myanmar. I'm not here to police Bangladesh. I'm here to see if this is a viable solution for the Myanmar refugees. I personally don't feel it is a viable solution. Why? Because Myanmar should not get away with their atrocities. And if people will be relocated to an island or uh, another country without having those perpetrators found, held accountable, 
that should not be done. And this is what I mean, enough is enough. And once you do that, the next step they're going to move on to is the other ethnic areas, which this, and they've already started to do. I hope there's no misunderstanding. And please don't accuse me for <laughs> blaming Bangladesh. That's not our job. Yeah. Uh, anyone from our female colleagues, media colleagues? Yes. This is Shumur Bari from uh, Eka2 Television, it's the 24 hours news channel. Uh, as a um, uh, special regular uh, situation of human rights in Myanmar, uh, so what do you got from Myanmar's side in your visit right now? Or um, uh, in these days, what do you got from Myanmar that, about the response? Or, or what about the situation, the safety? Moshet, uh, Channel 24. Hello there. I'm Hasib. I work for Channel 24. Uh, uh, Bangladesh is calling these people are forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals, UN calling them refugees, Myanmar calling them returnees in the signed MOU that they have signed with uh, UN. And uh, they call themselves Rohingyas. So what is the what is their identity and how come all these parties have come to one certain point? Who are these people? This debate needs to be stopped first and then, then the repetition comes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, perhaps this would be the last question from Register. Uh, uh, this is Purimo Palma, I'm from Daily Star. Uh, so you, have, you said that only 26% of the joint response plan was confirmed until now. So what, what do you foresee uh, about the funding uh, for the crisis? Um, thank you very much. Uh, the situation of Myanmar and the response, I'm not sure what... What, uh, what do you got from that? What do I get, get from them? Yes. They don't want the to cooperate from with here, me. Uh, from our side, you got the situation. Yeah. Talking with the Rohingya people and going to the border. And what do you got from them? Because... Uh, from them, are you referring to the people or the government authority? From, the, from their government. Oh, they don't want to communicate with, engage with me anymore. Are you concerned about that? Of course. You should be concerned about that too. The international community should be very concerned about that too. Okay? If they choose uh, not to accept somebody who was appointed by the Human Rights Council and has a resolution, human rights resolution, which Myanmar is party to, is member of the Human Rights Council, then I should be concerned and uh, the international community should be equally, if not more, concerned. Because it's not just me. It's not the issue of me as a person. It's an issue of cooperating with the mechanisms, human rights mechanisms. Um, Rohingya, and the return of the name, and etc. Yes, and some people call it the nomenclature. But, you know, we should move away from the nomenclature and this and that. However, it is a right of every individual person to self-identify. If they want to identify as Rohingyas, I think it should be respected. Um, in all of the documentations that I've seen, for instance, some documents that some of these uh, refugees preserve to bring over, I can see a sequence of the householders. These are official Myanmar do uh, documents where it states Rohingya, and then Rohingya, and then it moves to Bengali. So how do you, and then the parents, the grandparents had citizenship, the pink cards. They, they don't have, they're not uh, recognized. Rohingyas, they were parliamentarians elected. They had a party, political party. They were allowed to vote, run for office, have representation in the union uh, parliament. But how do you erase all that overnight? Or to, I'm sure it, it, it took you know, several years at the making. But 
This is what I mean. 26% of the funding what, uh, for the crisis. What, what? I think people like myself and others should keep reminding the international community that no country in the world would ever accept a million people on their land. No host community will never let allow people on their land. And Bangladesh is not a well-off country. Bangladesh is heavily populated. Land issue is a great challenge for Bangladesh. And the borders are still open. That's something that the international community should be aware of. And if they say, like talk that they will pledge this, you know, we, there's a saying that don't just do the talk, don't just talk the talk, but walk the talk. So this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Yangeli, the UN Special Rapporteur. Thank you, the media colleagues, for your active participation. Thank you. Thank you very much.